This film is about fish and the passion of people who keep them. Fancy fish in aquaria. And from the thousands of different species, they've chosen fish that suit their personalities, finding a magic in keeping alive foreign fish and sometimes breeding them in their front room. There are in Britain five million fish people. So what is the magic? The magic to me is the thousands of different species. I should think in this tank I've got three or four hundred different species of, of animals and fish living in close relationship with each other. The symbiotic relationship between the clowns and the enemies. The beauty, the sheer beauty of the different plants growing. Everything has a, a balance, a different a relationship, one looking after the other. The clowns feed the enemy and the anemone gives the clowns protection from the other fish eating them. Whenever they're attacked, they swim straight into the anemone. If anybody comes up to them and frightens them, they go straight into the anemone and hide. It's like that one just did there, so that they, no one can eat it or attack it. There's two magics. The, the main magic is that you can buy a fish this size. Well, obviously they start at this size, but I'm not that good to spot good fish at that size. So I buy them at this size and grow them to this size. And it, it sounds like a fisherman's tale, but just the, the skill that you have to learn, and I certainly don't know it all, but obviously know a little bit more than most people. It's just that how to get them to that, and you're all the time experimenting. And if you lose one, it's like losing a member of your family. I find it particularly interesting to find the little niches that these fishes have found for themselves where they can survive. We also enjoy, I think, fishing in the most unlikely places. Um, for example, in a swamp forest, um, the whole ground is squelchy and soft. And yet there in a puddle in the leaves, we find fish, which really is a place you'd never dream of fishing. But by just being determined and, and trying, we do find fish which have never been found before. Some fish are very, very difficult to breed and you have to work at it, persevere, try new ideas, try sometimes very unusual ideas to try and find a trick which triggers the fish into spawning. And the success of spawning really is the cream on the fish keeping. It's really a big magic, I think. The magic bit is going into the shed in the morning and thinking, I wonder if that female's got her babies out this I know she's due to release her babies this morning. Or, I wonder if that little pair of substrate spawners that the babies have hatched out and are swimming out of the cave. Or, I wonder if such a pair have spawned, because I knew they were due to spawn yesterday. There's always something to look forward to every time I open that shed door. And maybe the answer's no to every question that morning, but there'll always be the next morning, and maybe it'll happen tomorrow, you know, but there's always something to look forward to. The main attraction is, is the satisfaction of seeing the thing living. It becomes an ecosystem um, in your own front room. It's not as if I'm sort of playing any kind of a god figure keeping it going. I'm just drawing on resources that I've read about and expert advice from people that I know about. The first aquarium that I saw that interested me in fish keeping had a Corydoras catfish in it. And when I asked uh, my friend what the fish was, he said, this is a hoover fish. That caught my imagination right away. I said, you know, what do you mean a hoover fish? And he said, it cleans up the aquarium, all the uh, uneaten food this fish goes for and uh, tidies it up so the aquarium doesn't become polluted. And uh, he said, they also wink. And I, I couldn't imagine a fish winking, and I sat there and watched, and sure enough, it winked. <laughs> and I thought, this is incredible, a little fish that's adult at two or three inches, sort of winking back at me. I later on found out that the fish actually rolls its eye to clean it, but uh, I've never lost that idea that this fish was, was winking. When I was a very young lad, I always was fascinated by frog spawn and animals in ponds. And I wanted to uh, have a, a fish tank at home. And I asked my father, and he said, well, if I behave myself well, he would go out and buy me one. And one day, I turned up at home, and there was this small fish tank with uh, 
a goldfish in it with some weed, and I always remember that because I was really pleased with it, and I used to look after it and keep it. It's an animal with no teeth, no tongue, no stomach, and no fur. It can't be kissed and won't cuddle you back, but it's the most popular pet in the world. I think they're fascinating goldfish. They're lovely to look at. They're very interesting. They also, in spring, have a tremendous movement, which is rather like human beings getting together. And the noise sometimes brings us out from the kitchen. I mean, you can be there washing up or just looking out of the window and hear this tremendous splashing of water when they're obviously choosing their mates and getting together. It's quite fascinating. Right, Tony. Nice and slowly now. Nice and slow. Very slow. And the care of their fancy goldfish binds together here a father and a daughter. OK. There you go. Right. Try again. Let's see what we've got here, Tony. My word, look at that they got. A few dinners there for the baby fish, isn't there? that you can get at any polluted pond. The fish love this, it's good for them. The goldfish have been around for a couple of thousand years and the Chinese discovered them. They thought they were such beautiful colours and they were good to eat. Um, they cooked them in terracotta pots. Uh, they started breeding them, playing around with them, and they decided that they wanted to breed a fish with eyes that turned up instead of the sidewards. It was so unusual, they hadn't seen a fish like it before, that they took it to the Emperor of China. He thought they were adoring him because the eyes on these goldfish were turned up. I've been brought up with them. Since as long as I can remember, my dad kept them. I like fish, I think they're peaceful. I like watching them grow up from tiny little things to sizes like this. I think it's great, you know, to have, to have a child that's got the same interests or shares the same interests. Um, it's great. I think it's just a pity her mother doesn't of the same interest, um, make life a lot easier. But basically, it, it's good because you can you can do things together. Um, I mean, some of the places I get to, looking at fish and looking for the food for the fish, with Tony, the things we've seen, it's well, we wouldn't have seen them if it hadn't have been for you know the interest in the goldfish. Watch out for them more hens along here. Yeah. We, we go around looking at different ponds. If we see one that we think is going to be good for the fish, we found one, excellent pond. There's all sorts there. There's deadly nightshade, foxglove, water rats, uh, great diving beetles. I love it, it's just really peaceful and I like looking at all the nature that's around it as well as going for the food. Sometimes you're messy and covered in muck and duckweed. Yeah. But your dad's, your dad's little helper, aren't you? Yeah. I've been keeping goldfish, actually keeping them since I was oh, younger than a teenager. But um, keeping them seriously and showing them for the last 15 years now. And it's, I developed such an interest because they are a type animal. And that appeals to me, breeding something for shape rather than something such as tropical fish, which are bred for the color alone.
There is a definite analogy between dogs, the different breeds, cats, the different breeds, and the different varieties of fancy goldfish. I think what attracts people to breeding some of the individual varieties is simply a case of beauty is in the eye of the beholder. One person is going to find a particular variety attractive, and it's then a challenge to them to breed and better them. I find that certain varieties are unattractive to me. Hideous isn't a word I would use, but perhaps simply out of ethics because it's my business. I'm attracted to the ranchu. To me, it's the king of goldfish, and also the fish swims so well. Many of the fancy varieties just waddle through the water. The value on special goldfish in Japan is absolutely open. There's a lovely story about a rancher in Japan actually being exchanged for an English Rolls Royce. And of course, that's worth a lot more in Japan than it is in England. For professional goldfish, sex has to be controlled. The goldfish breeder can't just rely on free love. We have two female and one male rancher in here. First of all, the male is taken from the small bowl, squeeze some milks from the male, spread it through the water, not in a circle, because it just travels to the center. From side to side, first female, gently to release the eggs, again from side to side to spread the eggs evenly over the matting. Now the second female, repeat that. Just pushing very, very gently. Not hard, otherwise you'll damage them. And now some milk from the male again to fall over the top of the eggs. The breeder must now outplay Darwin when the eggs hatch and select not the fittest, but the fanciest. The eggs that you saw spawning earlier of the rancher would take approximately six days to hatch at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. The fry I have in front of me are approximately two weeks old, and you can see the tails beginning to develop. At this stage, for the rancher, you're looking for a widespread tail. You don't want anything that's too close, and at the same time, you don't want anything which is beginning to turn up on the ends. You want a central line running from the nose down the body right to the tip of the tail. So follow that through, and any tails which are off true, slanting to one side, they must be discarded. Also at this stage, you can begin to look for those with the best width between the eyes, which will develop the better hoods. These young ranchers are now six to seven weeks old. At this stage, you have to look more in depth to the fish for some of the characteristics which are now developing. Some, such as this fish here, are too short and squat. That fish will tend to be a headstander when it develops a hood. Others, the tail is beginning to flick up on the edges. They won't swim properly, such as this fish. This, in my opinion, has a good chance of being the best one of this batch. It's a good strong fish. The nose is beginning to square off where the hood is already beginning to develop. And the tail is about right at this stage. The quest for the perfect specimen applies also to koi, fish which may live for 200 years. All koi have personalities. They've all got something that makes Firstly, all their patterns are different. There are no two fish ever the same. It's impossible. But their temperaments are also different. For instance, I have fish that will never feed off the top. No matter how hungry they are, they will wait for the food to fall to the bottom. I've got certain fish that will not eat any of the food that I put in, but live purely off the algae on the side of the ponds. That's wonderful for them, but not all fish will do that. And some of them, they like to play. I know that sounds silly, but they actually play in the water. Mm -hmm. 
in this house lives a very lucky fish. His name is TC, short for Top Cat, with a healthy appetite. And who doesn't enjoy a slice of fresh trout for breakfast? We went to look round the fish shops and we'd seen him. And once we were satisfied we could handle a fish that size, then we went ahead and bought him and brought him home uh, about three or four weeks later and installed him in his house. And the reason we chose him was um, for his colouring. And there was just a, a mutual attraction between us and the fish. It's the size of the fish that attracted me, first of all. But uh, since we've been keeping it, there's a lot more to it than just the size. It's special to me because um, I often have a chat to him, although it seems silly, I do often chat to him, and he seems to respond to me. Um, if I tap him a glass, he'll come up to it. Um, mainly, I think, because he might be hungry, but other than that, um, I like to think that he can feel some attraction towards me as well. I can stroke him and touch his tummy. When I'm feeding him, sometimes I grab hold of his tail and he just gently tries to swim away. He, he doesn't swim away as though he's scared, you know, he just mess around and as though he's enjoying part of the contact. Although I don't actually get him out and cuddle him, I can actually show affection towards him. You can communicate with him. It's not as, as though he's a fish in a tank. You can actually, you know, he seems to respond. I don't think there'd be any less love given to TC when we have got our own children than what there is now, because he's been part of our family for so long. Over the last 10 years, I've had many letters from people uh, asking questions about catfishes. In fact, I'm probably the agony auntie of uh, catfishes. Uh, every month in magazines, I make replies uh, to some of the special letters that I receive. In fact, uh, John and Sue Holmes uh, wrote me several letters about the red-tailed catfish, including one where the catfish had swallowed a piece of equipment in the aquarium, and uh, their local veterinary surgeon had suggested uh, an operation, uh, and I predicted to them that, in fact, the catfish would regurgitate uh, the object, and uh, sure enough, it did. Without any formal biological training, David Sands has written many expert books on his beloved catfish. I often get to know some of the larger catfishes by getting hold of them. Um, it's something I used to do a lot once, I don't do as much now. But uh, I have a young uh, selfing uh, catfish known as Pterygoblichthys gibbiceps. We call it Terry Gibb for short. And uh, my party piece is basically to uh, show people that he can breathe out of water. See if I can catch him. Will I do it? So I've done this with specimens that are almost two feet uh, large. So as you can imagine, this is just a, a juvenile. But nonetheless, he could happily stay out of water for a good hour or so with no problems at all. Stingray, he's started off eating frozen shrimp, but since I've been giving him live shrimp, I've been managing to feed him by hand. And uh, he doesn't seem to want to take anything else now. He just expects me to actually put live shrimp in there, and he'll just come and take them out of my hand. And he eats quite a lot of those. I don't know why I like him so much. I think it's because he's obviously quite an intelligent fish. He's a very dangerous fish, of course, because he's got a venomous sting and it can paralyze you if you are stung by it. The wholesalers who deal with these, one of the guys concerned has been stung by these fish about three times and he was in hospital for four days each time. They're uh, 
probably quite dangerous, but I think only if you stand on them or, or, or frighten them and if you have your hand in the wrong place. I would say they definitely do have personalities and it might be quite hard for people to think that they would have because they don't have fur on them, they don't look cuddly and you can't really hold them or do anything like that with them. But they have personalities which you'll notice after you've been looking at the tank for a long enough time. The Stingray, he has electrical sensors on his body. He can detect the whole environment. He can make up a picture of the environment that he's in and notice any changes. So for any new fish in the environment, he can tell that it registers. Um, he can also detect electrical impulses in the muscles of any other fish that are in the area, including things that he's trying to attack or trying to eat. A koi is a derivative of the normal, what we call common carp. They started off as brown fish, and uh, over 200 years, the Japanese have bred them for their colours. And uh, right now, they're breeding them more for their strength and their size than their colours. They've got their colours right now. They're trying to get their body weights back to the size of the original fish. There's four basic varieties. There's the red and white one, which is the favourite fish of Japan. That's called the kahaku. Um, you then have the red or the black red and white fish, which is named after the last emperor, which is called the Showa. And then somewhere here, you have a white, red and black fish. This is a Sankey. Now, this is a, a German skinned fish, which is called a Deutz. Hasn't got scales. It's got a leathery skin with a row of scales down its middle line. Um, the fourth sort, it's called a parachina. Uh, it's called an ogon, which I've got a parachina version here, which means it's a white one. Um, they come in yellows and golds um, without any pattern at all, just colour. The thing with the pond, and I do have friends who come around and say, ooh, why do you keep all that gunge around? Well, I think gunge is very, very valuable. First of all, the frogs enjoy it, the frogs, toads that come into this pond. Secondly, it provides some kind of food and also it provides coverage. The only difficulty is one must keep the pond very clean. Children should never touch anything to do with pond life. I mean, if I put my hand in down there now, there's all kinds of wiggly things, but they're all part of the pond life, you see. They're, they're um, edible. The thing that fascinates me is the, um, the way that the snails lay their eggs. I mean, almost anything that's green, you see, absolutely covered. Um, they love green stuff, and it, it doesn't matter how many snails, because they never do any harm to a pond at all. They're part of the pond life. The wiggly things, I think you... Uh, what, I, what I do believe is that you should put gloves on. If you, I don't always do that, unfortunately, I should. But um, when you take the gunge out and you look at it, there's minute little tiny things that can actually get embedded into your nails or your fingers, or if you scratch your face, it'll go... So I think people should be m very much aware of that, that pond life is fascinating interesting, uh, wonderful hobby, but also it can be deadly. It can be very, very dangerous indeed because there are the minutest little tiny uh, wigglies. God knows what their names are. Some of the minutest of wigglies do in fact have an important part to play in the creation of this world captured within glass. Well, the water obviously is polluted by the excretion of the fish and also the corals. So what you have to do is you have to have a miniature sewage system within the system of the tank, which is created by dripping the water over uh, a special filter materials, which allow the oxygen and bacteria to, to meet 
and develop and eat up the, the waste. Therefore, the water's consistently being purified. But one of the problems is that the marine inverts eat the minerals to survive the gold and magnesium and other metals in the salt. So that needs replacing consistently to hold the salt water as near to the environment of the sea as possible. At the beginning, I had very, very little success. I used to keep them for three, four, five weeks. Maybe some things would never die, but the harder corals just wouldn't live. And I didn't really know why. The first thing I discovered that the lighting wasn't correct, and I had to get suitable lighting that would penetrate the depths. Having changed the lighting, I had a little bit more success, but still not enough to grow pulse corals and other corals. I decided at this stage that there must be some other secret. I examined the water and found tremendous nitrates in the local water, and we set up a filter system to remove the nitrates. The other thing I was told is that you had to consistently change the salt water 25% every four weeks. But I found that was too great a shock to the system. So I decided to put a drip system in, built a reservoir, and drip the water in constantly, changing it. The next thing I found was necessary was a tremendous water movement. And the water movement is essential for the growth of many of the corals. And then you can see from the tank itself that the soft corals, for the first time, began to multiply and grow and survive. One thing we do that is a misconception, we don't really look after the fish. They do that themselves. What we do is we look after this. Our hobby is about keeping water, because the better you can keep this, the better the fish like it. Uh, we're very lucky in the northwest to have fabulous pH in the water. I mean, it, it's just perfect. Um, the nitrite we can cure by the filter system, but we can't do anything about the pH. We're just blessed with very good water in the northwest. It annoys me when people don't look after fish. People say that fish are cold-blooded, well, and they don't feel anything. I'm sorry, that's not true. Because if I give the one of them an injection, you, you see the, they squirm. Ah, the worst aspect is when they're sick and you, you feel so helpless, you don't know what to do. Uh, I've medicated, but fortunately these fish, they tough as old boots, they, they rarely ail anything. They sometimes um, battle scars when they've been fighting, or sometimes they get a cloudy eye, uh, but those are easily taken care of. But if you get a fish that just suddenly stops feeding and looks really sick, you feel it's such a helpless feeling, you want it to survive and go on living, but you don't know what to do because there's not such a lot known about fish diseases. So that, that's the tragic part about it. And of course, sometimes, it's not very often happened, but when a tank cracks and you get water all over the floor and fish flopping about in the bottom of the tank in an inch of water, that's a tragedy. I get people ringing me up at two o'clock in the night, getting me out of bed, uh, to say the fish is hovering on the surface of the water, gasping, and I give them answers and I try and help them save that fish. But if the fish weren't imported and made available in the first place, maybe that kind of thing wouldn't happen. I went over to the to the pond and uh, this goldfish was laying on its side. Now I knew that uh, soon it would be dead. So I picked it up and looked at it and its mouth was full, um, blocked up with dirt, which I assume it must have gone down to the bottom of the pond and by mischance swallowed a lot of dirt. I know this will sound very silly, but I've read so much about the kiss of life and uh, I just gave it a little blow and um, another little blow and so on, and it survived. I bought um, a small shower in Japan. It was this size. Uh, it, was, it was a beautiful pattern. It was one of the, the, the nicest patterns that I'd ever seen. Um, I bought it home and it arrived safely and in good condition. Uh, I bought it up. And I was so proud of it, I must have spent two or three hours just watching it swimming around. I went to bed and it jumped out of the tank and was dead in the morning. I mean, I was mortified. The value that I paid for it was, was immaterial, it didn't matter. It was the fact that it had actually died out, out of my stupidity because I, you know, I should have put a net over the tank that night because when they're strange to the water, they jump. Because what they do is they clean their gills out by actually taking extra air by diving out of the water. 
she had dived out the water and got trapped in one of my fishing nets, you know, that I catch them with. And that was, that was idiotic of me to even have done that. So, you know, it's like for days and days, I walked around really depressed that I'd allowed that to happen. We had a tank in this corner behind me and uh, I had a beautiful gold sail fin Molly in the early days. And uh, he was, as Molly's gold fins are, the, very short-sighted and uh, especially fond of him. And he died one day, one of these mysterious fish diseases. And um, I was sitting here shedding the tears and wringing a wet handkerchief out. And my daughter came in from work and she said, Mum, what's the matter? What's the matter? And I said, Cyril's died. He died today. Poor Cyril. And she said, oh, she thought it was somebody from work. And she said, oh, had he been ill long? Uh, I said, no, he was all right, and then he just died. He was gone, he's gone. And she said, well, when's the funeral? And I said, what do you mean, funeral? I've just buried him in a rose tree in the backyard. <laughs> she... In this quiet Manchester backwater lives one of Britain's best breeders of cichlids. And their dedicated keeper, an expert now, is a lady who's agrophobic. Nancy Shuttle rarely leaves her home, but she's created inside an aquatic world where her gift for fish keeping flourishes. I first started keeping fish when uh, it was just an idea to brighten a dim alcove uh, with a little fish tank. And uh, it turned out to be a big four foot fish tank. And uh, of course, we were really hooped on fish from then, both of us. And uh, it was just another well for us. It was like coming home somehow, as if I'd been there before. Or I, I don't know, like a, maybe a premonition of what that one tank was going to lead to eventually, which is about 47 tanks now. But we knew nothing about fish keeping. Bob got a tank and it was his and hers tanks then, you know, all over the house. This is my tank and that's your tank and what are you doing in your tank? And there was a lot of elbow in it, you know, I was, I was doing something or he was doing something or which fish he got that I wanted. And, uh, but it was just... It started from guppies and mollies and graduated to catfish, angels and cichlids and now the um, African fish, uh, which take up all my time now. I found that cichlids are more interesting. They seem to have more personality. You can occasionally get two males, each with a female, ready to spawn. They spawn close together and the, the more dominant male will usually drive the subdominant male away so that he'll go to the other end of the aquarium eventually and find another spawning area of his own. But sometimes they, it just doesn't happen that way. Uh, and um, of course they're both spawning merrily away on the same stone. <laughs> And when there are problems like this, there are various things you can do because I like to breed the fish. So I can put a tank divider into the tank uh, and isolate that little pair at one end of the tank so that they can spawn in private without the other fish interfering. Or I can move them to another tank, which sometimes to move them, they just freeze and they just go so nervous that nothing happens. And then, of course, the females, they come into season like a lot of animals, and they must spawn during those three days when the egg duct appears. So um, you just have to manoeuvre it so that you isolate the pair just at the right moment. Fish keeping is a perfect pastime for lonely people. And at Edinburgh Prison, one of the lifers has become an expert on tilapia, a type of cichlid. The first eight years of his sentence have not been wasted by Alex Torbett. The 
came home one night and found my wife had left me. She took my boy, practically cleared out of the house. I had no indication it was going to happen, and I just lost control. And uh, I went after her in the hope of talking her into coming back or sorting it out. Her father wouldn't, let, wouldn't even let me speak to her. Things went from one thing to another and finished up. I killed both of them. Within a matter of minutes, I'd lost everything, really. I was a long-term airman, four months from pension. It's not, I'd lost my family, my home, job. You know, just when I thought everything was as good as it could be, it all just fell apart and virtually came in here. I'd lost my own life, but pulled myself together and that's where the fish has been a big help. Fishkeeping has really helped me through my sentence by keeping my head together. The fish depend on me a lot, but I also depend a lot on them. It really helps me through my day, you know, knowing that they need me and I need them just as much. The main purpose of my work here is to maintain a steady supply of tilapia fry for Stirling University. This enables them to do research into their work for the third world. The tilapia fry, the baby fish, are exported to developing countries. They'll be grown on in ponds because they're good to eat. The other prisoners are very supportive of the fish unit because they know it's for such a worthwhile cause. If it was for any other purpose than for the third world, I think this sort of thing would very quickly be sabotaged. They're very interested in coming in to see the fish. The record keeping is quite detailed and goes back right to the start of the unit, which is now almost 10 years. All, every spawning, the female is weighed, measured, and the fry are counted. This way, should any genetic improvement suddenly appear in one of the broods, we can trace the parentage back. Alex Torbert's fish breeding saves Stirling University £100,000 a year, which their aquaculture department can use in other areas of research. The tilapia are often reared in paddy fields, where they eat the weeds and breed like mad. Dr Randolph Richards has been involved for some years with the tilapia project. At the beginning of the project, we had major problems with trying to breed these fish in a controlled manner. Part of the problem was that we weren't able to devote enough attention and care, I think, to those fish. And the prison came in and were a major help in providing that expertise of careful fish keeping and observation, which then allowed us to set up a proper controlled breeding program. Well, at Stirling, we cover a wide range of aquaculture activities, fish farming both in the tropics and in temperate zones, um, we deal with a, the whole range of um, activities connected with fish farming. This includes engineering, uh, designing of fish farms, disease, uh, genetics, nutrition, etc. So it's really the whole gamut of fish farming techniques. Well, I think Alex Torbert has been especially useful in that he, he seems to have green fingers with fish. He has a great technique in um, breeding these fish. He's able, through ob careful observation, to work out the best methods of production and obviously he cares a lot for the fish and I think it's that care and great interest in, in, in the subject that, that makes all the difference. Overcoming the difficulties of breeding freshwater fish is challenging enough. But it's even more remarkable when marine fish settle down to breed. Well, the clownfish are interesting because they've paired up 
and they bred in the tank. And they have a most unusual male-female relationship. All of them start off as males, and one of them becomes the female, the dominant female in the end, which is the larger one of the two. And if the female were to die, a male would grow up to become a female, change sex and become a female. It's quite a, an unusual life cycle. of marine fish is so high that the experimentation with the corals takes a high income budget to be able to afford it if you want to experiment to learn. One of the problems is that people in the shops who sell the marine inverts, they haven't as much knowledge as they should have and therefore they misguide people into believing they can keep things which they can't. I think the quality of most garden centres, I can't say all garden centres because I haven't been to all of them, but a lot of the garden centres shouldn't be allowed to keep fish because A, they, the conditions are appalling. And you can always spot, if anybody's watching this programme and goes into garden centres, you can spot bad fish by looking at the fins. If their fins aren't intact, that they're split, it usually means that the quality of the water is so poor that the uh, ammonia in the water is actually penetrating the fins. And that's one of the first signs that the water quality is really bad. And I know that most dealers in the United Kingdom buy fish at between 150 and 250 pounds and sell them for five and six thousand pound. And that really annoys me because what it does is it makes hobbyists in Great Britain think they're buying fish of a really good quality. In fact, they're not, they're buying very low grade quality. But if you're gonna buy high grade bloodline fish, you're gonna start at babies costing you a thousand pound like this. Grand champion fish go for 300 and 400 thousand pound each. The only thing that worries me Sometimes is, is stories that I've heard about how these things are treated when they're caught, how they're kept at certain wholesalers, and there are certain pet shops that don't seem to know how to look after them. That bothers me more than anything else. It's, it's like an industry like everything else, and uh, I mean, you're going to find that everywhere. It's, it's a livestock industry, and, and there are things that are out of order with, with parts of that, for sure. But none of the things that I'm keeping are rare or endangered or should be returned to the wild. Last year, nearly 500 million fancy fish were imported into Britain. Most of these are probably dead today. And all serious fish people are becoming increasingly worried about conservation. I think the future lies with people who can breed fishes and make them available through the hobby rather than over collection in the wild. I'm not particularly concerned about over collection for the aquarium trade, but I am concerned in that a lot of the environments where the fish are collected are becoming endangered and maybe the fish trade adds to the pressure on that ecosystem. The lifespan of killifish is only a few months. They have evolved to live in seasonal pools in the tropics and die when the pool dries up. But their eggs are left behind to hatch when the rains return. One of the things that we care about with killifish is that because they live in such small pools, they're very prone to be wiped out. And this does happen in various parts of the world. Developers, agricultural drainage, these sort of things. Uh, surveyors can, can build a new town, as, as was the case with Brasilia. Um, and the bulldozers can start work. Uh, the, and the people concerned, if they're up there in the dry season, may not even know that there is a pool there, let alone that it is the total habitat for a particular species. And in fact, uh, is the entire habitat for that species. So they are very prone to be wiped out in nature, and the British Killerfish Association has been involved in re-establishment of species in one or two parts of the world.
we find in many cases that the species which we find are not known to the fisheries officers of the district. Um, and they are interested in what we find. And we hope that as a result of our finding the species, that they will perhaps have an incentive to conserve the area. Um, some of the fishes come from very small areas of swamp forest, which are not really at all productive economically. So if they know that there is a, a few species of fish there, very locally distributed, there is an incentive to preserve a very small area, which might otherwise seem to be of no value at all. Barbara and Alan Brown travel to distant parts to study and collect rare fish. The passion of some of our fish people will know no bounds. No, we have no children, which I think is why we can commit ourselves so wholeheartedly to fishes and to our hobby. Um, we can be very selfish, really, in what we do. Our holidays really would not be suitable to take children along, so we can do exactly what interests us. Well, this is one of the places that I used to come to just for peace and quiet, to get away from it after a hard day at the office. It's quite nice to come here, just look at the river. Well, I used to think that maybe I was in a tropical country in South America and that the, the river, it's not dissimilar, it's only the temperature that's different. And I used to plan or think about catching the fish in it. If, they, if it had been a tropical stream, uh, how I would go about catching the fishes in it. All the books that I had showed pictures of small offshoot creeks in South America and they looked very much like an English creek. So I could, with a bit of imagination, make this place into a creek in South America. My interest in catfishes grew to perhaps as far as it could possibly grow. I gave up my job in the city. At one stage I, I had a lot of aquariums and it became all-consuming. I probably spent more time with my fish than I did with my family. I became addicted and that's what I am, there's no question about it, I'm addicted to them. I mean I spend as much possible time as I can reading about them, talking about them. Well, they just occupy me. Uh, if it wasn't for the fish, I, I, I think I'd probably get very depressed and neurotic, maybe, I don't know, being uh, not able to get about like most other people can. I mean, other people have friends and families they visit and go to places, but um, I, I don't really want that. I'm quite happy with the fish, but if I didn't have the fish, I don't know, I'd just dread to think what my life would be like. It'd be terribly restricted. I think the fish take the part of friends and relations. Uh, they're my family, and I know they depend on me and I depend on them, and that gives me something that's a, an aim in life. I've got to go on living for them. Before I went to South America, Brazil, I probably had dreams every night, and some of them were incredibly exotic. I remember one dream vividly where uh, I found my way through the rainforest and came across a sunken Inca palace. And uh, when I dropped down into the palace, very Indiana Jones style, there were all these corridors catfishes, uh, 10 times larger than life, sat up in the rafters chirping at me. And all I had to do was lift up my hands and they came down to me like Francis of Assisi. If you're a Liverpool fan, it's the ultimate when they lift the FA Cup. For me, when I see a fish that is absolutely stunning, you know, my heart beats faster and my blood pulses quicker, you know, and it's like in records and we have to be number one as regular as possible. I'm not really interested in just making records that are good records. I'm only interested if people buy them because it makes them better than everybody else's and it's the same with the fish. I love them all, but for me personally, it might have to be the best or it's just pointless me doing it.
What did you leave this?